So I'm uh, Henry Sagerman, as I said before. Uh, oh, do you need to grab your computer out of the way? Good. Um, this is uh, Sveta Matsumoto. And um, so we are talking about these um, geared versions of the jitterbug. We can do this kind of thing. So we'll hand these around so you can play with them while we talk about what's going on. Um, so the, the setting here is um, auxetic uh, mechanisms. So an auxetic mechanism is some sort of uh, object mechanism, which when you pull on it, it gets bigger in all directions rather than, you know, most things you pull on it, it gets thinner in the middle. Um, so this is an example, uh, a two-dimensional planar uh, auxetic mechanism made out of squares hinged at their corners. Um, or you can do something with uh, triangles hinged at their corners, and now you've got these uh, hexagonal holes instead of the square holes, the Kagame mechanism. And moving from the flat planar to the spherical, uh, we get uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, jitterbug mechanism. So this is sort of a combination of the two previous ones we saw in that the, the holes here are square, um, but the, the solid pieces are triangles rather than squares. So uh, somehow it's a combination of the two, and, and then that wraps around, and you get this uh, going from the octahedral shape up to this uh, cube octahedral shape. Um, and you'll notice maybe it's a little hard to see exactly what's going on at the vertices, and so there's a sort of interesting question there. You know, how do you get it to do the motion that you want rather than other motions that maybe it wants to do that you don't want it to do? So, so this, is, this is the motion that you want. Um, and notice, uh, right, that at least in this animation, these are sort of point hinges. So if you actually make this out of card, say, and you just, you know, uh, have some flexible uh, point joint uh, at the ends like this, then it doesn't only do this. There's an extra sort of couple of uh, degrees of freedom of things it can do. Um, uh, so it was actually somebody, not Buck Mr. Fuller, it was somebody called Dennis Dreher, uh, who realized that you could arrange it with a little bit of extra mechanism to cut down on those extra degrees of freedom so it just did exactly what you want, which is this motion here. So what's the difference here? We've got these little triangular pieces in here, um, and those are sort of rather than pin joints, those are hinge joints. And uh, so it turns out that these restrict the motion to only this one degree of freedom. This does exactly what you want. And I guess you can try and think about, you know, how would you come up with adding these extra pieces of uh, mechanism to, to force it to do this? So one way to think about this is these uh, triangles, they're sort of moving in and out from the, the center, but their normal direction is fixed. And so if their normal direction is fixed, uh, if you've got two triangles that are moving, rotating relative to each other, but their normals are fixed, that means that you're, you can sort of thicken up the triangles in that normal direction, and those extra uh, thickened edges that you're, you're making are going to stay in the same place relative to each other. They're, they're not moving, and that means that you can safely put this little triangle in there, and it's not going to sort of somehow want to break apart as this motion happens. But it turns out this restricts the motion to... Uh, uh, to only do the one degree of freedom that you want. Um, so what was our contribution here? So first thinking just about the octahedron was uh, to gear this uh, mechanism like this. So, um, so, well, so in the previous slide, I showed you just these, uh, uh, these hinge joints. And that will work. And, and mathematically, it has only one degree of freedom. But there's a difference between mathematics and the real world, as many of us know. Unfortunately, things don't always work the way that you want them to. What these gears are doing is it's not restricting it any more mathematically, but it is restricting it more in a sort of physical way. It's forcing certain things to rotate at the same rate relative to each other, um, and it generally makes it a more stable mechanism than if you only have uh, the hinges. So, well, what is the geometry of these? these uh, uh, the two bevel hinge, uh, sorry, bevel gears are meeting along that uh, the sort of midpoint of the little red triangles that we had before, the midline between them. Again, that's that's fixed under the motion. So uh, so these two gears will uh, uh, mesh into each other throughout the motion, um, and the uh, so they're bevel gears going uh, from the the points where the uh, the triangles come together outwards. Um, uh, and well, right. So, so this set of gears uh, rotate relative to each, to each other through axes that meet in a, at a particular point. And there's a standard uh, kind of gearing called bevel gearing, which will do that. And so, 
uh, the construction of this set of gears, later set of gears coming up later, this is not true. This set of gears wasn't particularly difficult to make. These are just standard planar gears, but then you sort of cone them to a point to get these bevel shapes. Um, so here's a, a, a GIF of um, the, the 3D print that's going around. Um, there's some you know, me mechanism to change the sort of idealized picture into something that actually works. You can see there's these little um, uh, 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 split plugs that will uh, plug through and, and click in so that the, uh, everything is uh, movable. We didn't print this as a single object. These are printed in parts which are then assembled because we need better tolerance than you can get away with uh, when you're printing in place. And here's uh, a nice video of the, um, the 3D print. One thing to notice here, which, uh, which is an interesting feature of this one, is that the, the two triangles on opposite sides don't rotate relative to each other when you move them out. Um, you, so you can just move them and you kind of, kind of bounce it like this. Now, on to the cube octahedron. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, another type of jitterbug. So we started with an octahedron that um, opens up to a cube octahedron. So what happens if you make a jitterbug that starts with a cube octahedron and opens up. So this is an animation of what that would look like. So it starts as a cube octahedron. Um, each uh, vertex of a square is connected to a vertex of a triangle. Um, and again, this is in the point hinge uh, description. And these open up to make a rhombic uh, cube octahedron. Um, so in order to uh, gear this, we needed to work out what the motion of each of the squares and triangles is. Um, so what we did, uh, as Henry mentioned before, is uh, you start with a face, and the face can move along its normal, but is restricted from moving anywhere else. Um, and we also know that um, the corner has to be uh, fixed, or not fixed, but the corners have to be uh, incident with each other. So as we um, make this rotation, um, you can see that the corner stays in the same place. It turns out that this is a nasty set of trig functions, not surprisingly. Um, and although the triangle needs to rotate by uh, 60 degrees, uh, or sorry, 120 degrees, and the, key, uh, the square has to rotate by 90 degrees, this isn't a linear relationship. So normally when you make gears, you can have different gearing ratios. So one rotates slow and the other rotates fast. And that's just by changing the radius of the gears. But since we really want this motion to be smoothly mechanical, we can't do that. So the rest of what I'll be telling you about is how we designed these acircular gears and how we added teeth to them. So this is uh, a bit similar to some of the things you saw in um, Oscar's talk um, on the first day of the plenary. So what goes into making acircular gears? You can imagine that there is some curve you want to follow. You've got a fixed point here and a fixed point here. These are going to be your axes of rotation. And as you rotate one curve through some angle theta, the arc length that goes from 0 to theta has to be the same as the arc length that the other one sweeps out going from 0 to whatever other angle phi it rotates through. So that is the condition that you need to have um, gears fixed to one another. So arc length is kind of a nasty integral. Oh, the other thing we would like to say is that um, the distance between each of the um, each of the axes is fixed. So in this case, it is um, it is scaled to be one. So it turns out that arc length is kind of a nasty integral. So um, I don't actually know how to solve integral equations, so we decided to discretize it. Um, so I thought this was going to be an easy, you know, first year mechanics problem. It turns out I got integral equations. Then I discretized it, and it turns out that all I need to do is solve the law of cosines twice. Um, so that went from something that's really hard to something that, um, that is high school level uh, trigonometry. And that would allowed us to derive the, um, the if I know what uh, one of my radii is, what the other radii has to be based on um, the 
the function of the angles that they sweep out. Um, so this gives us these sort of interesting profiles. So this one's kind of bow shaped and this one is a little bit kidney shaped. Um, and then the last thing we need to do is figure out how to cut the teeth. So that condition I showed you before is um, keeping this dashed blue line and the dashed pink line here um, in contact as it rotates through. So what I've done is I've taken just, this is called a linear rack, so it's a sort of t some, how you would gear something that is straight. And I'm basically going to keep it tangent to uh, the point on the curve and rotate it through, and I'm gonna carve away all of the stuff in the sort of dark blue and dark red regions that it comes in contact with. Um, and that's a way of carving out teeth so that the two gears always mesh exactly at the same point and with a constant pressure angle. So this is, um, these are the envelopes of the curves and this is the profile I will now use to cut out the gear teeth here. So this is um, the result. Um, and now basically we've got these um, acircular gears. We go through exactly the same process that Henry mentioned before. So these get sort of coned down to um, a point here. Um, and these green connector regions again have those split plugs. Um, and this is the final mechanism. So as you're passing it around, you can look at those gears and see that they actually don't have um, a circular profile. And now that we're running out of time, uh, here's an animation of me playing around, or this is not an animation, this is a video of me playing around with it. I wish I was that good at animating things. Um, and so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Are there questions for the speakers? Yes. So in one of the animations, the, uh, when you were first explaining the teeth mechanism, mm -hmm. it was jumping down a little bit. Is that, is that a numerical thing from the discrete animation, or is that something else? Let's see which animation? Just the first one with a line, a wiggly line. This, this one? one? Yeah, this one. It moves up and down just a little bit. Like it, is, is that some, what is that? Um, it's probably the way it's pixelizing the right. movie, so I might have taken like slightly larger steps in rendering it than I did when I was actually doing the carving part of it, so it's probably just a numerical error for that. Because it feels so smooth that like, none of that's present in the final result, is it? It's, uh, I mean, it's just, some, some yeah, it's going to have, it's going to be numerical. smooth. There's going to be a little bit of, a little bit of wiggle, but that might also, I think that's a numeric artifact of rendering that particular video. Even if the rack is wiggling up and down, the rack is only the, the boundary of the envelope that's cut away from the two gears. So, so you wouldn't. Yeah, so the, the, the teeth themselves, uh, sorry, are smooth. So this is, so as you sort of stitch those points together, you do get a smooth curve, even if it did wiggle a tiny bit. I guess you could feed a, a sort of a rack through and see if it wiggles up. Yeah, you could, you could do that, yeah. I bet it would, because the real world. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yes. So, one thing, as I look at it, I always come in pairs, and when I meet, is it possible to change the pairs theoretically, not practically? Mm -hmm. Uh, we, theoretically, yes. yeah. Yeah, so we've thought about that, yeah. and it would be kind of cool to come up with some mechanism where like yeah, magnets right. work in one way, and then as soon as they connect, the other ones disconnect. And, yeah. but, no, but yeah, you could, you could, uh, <laughs> yeah, if, if I, uh, cheated on my animation, you could get like sort of infinite cyclical motion. Do you use the job of bladder uh, toy for sorry, two ribbons, so three ribbons actually going uh, out in the uh, computer? Right. Are there any other questions? Are there more for Hydra? You could do the, um, well, you could do, what is the one with triangles and? And uh, uh, oh, the icosahedral would work. You, mm -hmm. what, you need that the vertex degree is even. Um, at least you need that the vertex degree is even because the the way that they open open up, the holes open up. There's you know open closed, open closed. Um, so there's a question. So we went from the octahedron to the cube octahedron, and from the cube octahedron to the rhombic cube octahedron. 
which also has even degree, but you just do another one, yeah. um, maybe the geometry would start to complain. There may be other restrictions. You had thought about doing uh, prisms as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. You could also do um, which prism? Like a. You wanted the. One. Oh, the, the anti-prism. Yeah, yeah, the square yeah, yeah. anti-prism yeah. could, yeah. could be an interesting yeah. Let's thank all, right. all of the speakers in the session. <laughs>